welcome back to our Road to Steam series, a series in which we'll be creating a game from scratch. Previously on our Who's Dev Diaries, we managed to complete our basic combat loop by implementing our slow motion system and the player's multiple disadvantageous states. We've also set up our first set of working spawners and updated our character models for increased visual feedback. In today's episode, we'll pick up where we left off and implement arrows in our combat sandbox. If you're interested in more video game behind the scenes like this, join us by subscribing to the channel for exquisite Hussein delights. So, without further ado, let's dive right into it. On the battlefields of old, a wide variety of weapons were used, but none were as prevalent as the bow and arrow. Archers would often make the third of an army's total size, as they were really effective at reducing the enemy's numbers from a distance. In Hoos, however, we want to take a different approach from the usual way arrows are used in combat. An approach that is more stylish and engaging. For this, we took inspirations from a classic. Matrix is quite masterful in the way it mixes martial arts and projectiles. In its action scenes, bullets are part of the close quarter exchange, where they become an extension of the martial art itself. This is the direction we are going for in Hoos. We aim to have a combat dance where you use arrows in tandem with your sword strikes, allowing you to create your own scenes from the Matrix. The catch is, you won't be firing any arrows. Here's how it works. The enemies we made so far cannot pass through each other's while they're moving. They push their neighbors around when they collide between themselves. Arrows on the other hand, do not share this characteristic. They will go through enemies on the battlefield, as well as being faster than them. Their other defining factor is that they will come at you at different height levels during combat, which leads us to our next mechanic. Like Neo does in the Matrix, you'll be able to dodge projectiles by switching your vertical stance. Dodged arrows will damage enemies on the opposite side, offering you more versatility in the way you control the battlefield. To dodge, you'll need to stay in the stance that's opposite to the arrow's current height level. If you want to attack it however, you'll need to directly match its current height level with the same vertical stance. But before implementing it, we need to do some groundwork. The issue we have at the moment is that all our actors in the scene are at the same position on the Z-axis. This means that our arrows will clip the models of our enemies when they pass through them. We need to avoid this for multiple reasons. The first one is for aesthetic purposes. It's never a pretty sight to see clipping in a game, as it breaks the immersion. The second one is for visual feedback. The player needs to have important visual cues available at all times for him to make informed decisions during combat. It's necessary for a smooth and enjoyable gameplay experience. Without this feedback, the game will seem unfair and players will be prone to destroy their controllers in absolute rage. Hey! <laughs> this issue can be resolved by setting our scene like a theater stage, where the scenery is placed in rows. But instead of using it for scenery, we'll create rows on which only certain types of objects can stay. As for example, a player row for our main character slash enemies, and a projectile row for our arrows. By doing this, we can organize our visual information by changing the position of rows in relation to each other. This is possible because of the orthographic camera that we have set up in our second episode. It allows objects to keep a constant size whatever their distance. That way, a specific enemy can be a thousand miles away, and it will still appear the same size as the one that is just beside the camera. Now that we have a way to organize our visual information, it's time to go in the trenches and set up the backbone of our projectiles. First, we'll create a script that locks the Z position of an object to the player's Z position. We do this because of the fact that our projectiles and player are no longer on the same row anymore. It will keep arrows colliders on the same plane as the player, making sure the targeting system works, while still displaying their models on the projectile row. The next thing we'll tackle is the arrow's height levels. These will dictate the vertical position of its model to inform the player on which stance he needs to be in to deal with the danger. 
However, this won't change the real position of the whole arrow. Its vertical position will always remain at zero. The thing it will change is the nature of its target collider, an object that is used by our raycasts to track hostile targets. As for example, if the arrow comes from the top, its collider will be set to high and the player's targeting system will only be able to track it if he is in high stance. With that done, we can now implement the mechanic of evading projectiles. Here's how it works. A vulnerable range is set up around the player. When arrows come into this range, they do a check on the player to know what's his current vertical stance. They then compare it to their current height level. If the comparison gives a negative outcome, the player will get hit. If the outcome is positive, the arrow will become friendly and continue on its merry way without being able to hurt the player anymore. Only high and low projectiles can be evaded. Middle arrows always need to be struck because the high and low stance cannot be used to evade them. To bring this to life, we'll first give our projectiles some movement speed and destroy them when they come in contact with the player. Next, we'll create a blurred image in Inkscape and import it in Unity. By turning it blue, this image will be used to give a visual feedback when an arrow turns friendly. Friendly arrows will also be able to hit arrows coming from the other direction, cancelling them out. The final thing we'll need to do is add some collisions to projectiles so that they do not overlap with each other. This is necessary because situations like having a high and middle arrow side by side can lead to unavoidable damage. If the player evades the top arrow, he'll get hit by the middle one, and if the middle one is struck, he won't be able to avoid the one coming from the top. The only exception to this rule is when a low and high projectile are side by side. If one of them is struck, the other one can be evaded. With this done, we can add our first working version of the arrow to the sandbox. game development, finding crazy ideas is often the easiest part. The real challenge lies in how to bring it to life without destroying everything you previously built. One change can culminate in a full-on calamity. So you need to be extra diligent in your search for exceptions, because the devil is really in the details. The next thing we'll show you is one of these edge cases. A pretty simple one, but don't be disappointed, we've got a real doozy coming later in the video. The problem shows its ugly head in a very specific situation. When the player is targeting an enemy that is behind an arrow, he will bypass the arrow while dashing to its target, avoiding the damage. The desired outcome would be to have him stopped and hurt on contact with the arrow. Currently, the player is invincible during his dash, so we could make him vulnerable to projectiles during this time to get the result we want. This would work fine with our current dash speed. However, the moment we would crank it above 100, the player would start to bypass the arrows again. This happens because the player teleports himself when moving, so when the dash speed is too great, he teleports himself behind the projectile like it was never there. To fix this, we'll create a fail-safe system during the dash. When the player will be dashing, we'll use a raycast that travels a certain distance to see if there are any obstacles in the way. If there is one, we'll compare its height level to the player's current stance. If all checks out, he'll continue its way to his target. However, if the result is negative, we'll teleport the player to the point where the raycast hit the obstacle and trigger his hurt state. By doing this, the player will no longer be able to bypass arrows, whatever his speed. With our basic setup done, it's time to add some nuanced features to really flesh out the experience. The first thing we'll do before going too deep into the mechanics is implement what happens to projectiles when the player is being pushed. Currently, we create a collision box around the player when he enters a hurt state, which is used to push enemies. We can't use that for arrows however, because it would be visually strange to see them being pushed around. The solution we have is to make them bounce from the player like his skin is made of steel, negating the damage of the arrows and destroying them. With that out of the way, the next thing we'll tackle is the slow motion effect. In other games, you'll often see a character's animation stop when a hit is landed. This is really useful to give a sense of impact, but it's also a great feedback to inform the player that the hit was successful. 
Currently, when there are a lot of arrows close to each other, the player will often feel he can evade them all, but because of a lack of strong immediate feedback, he'll get clipped by one of them, confident that he just evaded it. When a specific execution like this is made of multiple steps that require strict timing, players need to have some sort of hit confirmation to know that a specific step has succeeded. It helps players through execution heavy sequences that would be otherwise impossible. This feedback needs to be quickly and easily felt to correctly work. At the moment, our friendly blue glow around arrows does not meet this requirement. What we'll do to fix this is add a slow motion effect when the player hits an arrow or evades it, like what we did to our enemies. Now with this implemented, the player doesn't need to focus his attention completely on an arrow when he tries to evade it. He can focus his attention elsewhere while the world slows down and informs him of a successful dodge. Our arrows are taking shape, but the thing that will truly bring them to life is speed. There's nothing more badass than evading a projectile and feeling its extreme speed grazing you. The problem however, is that we cannot let our arrows go too fast because the game would become unplayable. The way we found to make this work is to increase the speed of arrows the moment you dodge them. We crank the speed to insane amounts, but quickly decrease it to give the feeling of a jet plane breaking the sound barrier just beside you. To showcase how satisfying it is, let's implement what happens when enemies get struck by arrows. Enemies can get hit from two sides. The back and the front. Friendly arrows will always hit from the front and cause knockback. Normal arrows on the other hand will always hit from the back and cause no knockback. However, normal arrows will only be able to hit enemies when they are in hit stun, otherwise they would stop at the first enemy they encounter. To complete the party, we'll make enemies evade arrows coming from the back for a more dynamic battlefield. When evading arrows, enemies will stop their movement, but they will still be targetable from all stances. This will allow more time for the player to assess the situation around him when he's surrounded by multiple arrows and enemies. With the core of our arrows complete, it's time to smooth out the experience with little gameplay additions. We'll present them in a rapid-fire style, as there are a lot of them. The first one we'll tackle is to destroy surrounding arrows when the player stomps. The reasoning behind this is the same as when we implemented the stomp for normal enemies. We want to give the player some breathing room after he gets hit to help him get back into the fight. Our second addition is to destroy arrows when they are too close to an enemy that just got hit by the player. This one is similar to when we added an area knockback effect on an enemy's death. At that time, we implemented this because when enemies were too close to each other, the player didn't have enough time after a kill to deal with the next enemy. This reasoning still holds true for arrows. So, instead of creating an area knockback effect that pushes them away, it will be one that destroys them. The next addition we'll tackle is the same as the previous one, but with the enemy and arrow rolls inverted. We need to push back enemies when they are too close to an arrow that just got hit by the player. The reason for this is still the same as before. It's to offer more time for the player to execute his next move. Our fourth addition is to create an area knockback effect around the player when he evades an arrow to push back enemies that are too close. We want to implement this to reward players when they go for an evade. If we don't add this, players will often get hit by enemies after an evade due to the fact that arrows can't reach the other side fast enough to stop the incoming enemy. The final adjustment we'll make concerns a very specific situation that wears its ugly head when we increase the overall speed of our projectiles. When the player dashes, he does not teleport himself to his target immediately. It takes him a certain amount of time to reach it, depending on his current dash speed. During that time, if an arrow has high enough speed, it can move ahead the player's target and hit the player. These situations can't be allowed to exist because they punish players for things they don't have control over, which can create a lot of frustration. To fix this, we'll stop the movement of arrows that come into contact with a targeted enemy and prevent them from attacking the player. That way, our player's controllers can live to see another day. To complete the integration of projectiles into our sandbox, we'll need to tackle a final edge case. This one stems from the fact that enemies can now be killed by things other than the player due to the introduction of arrows. Here's the conundrum. What happens when the player's target dies during his dash? 
With the way it's coded at the moment, the player will just continue to dash to infinity because targets are used as a reference point to stop him when he reaches the position. To fix this, we could stop the player's movement when his target dies by other means, but that would leave him vulnerable in the middle of the fight because of the unexpected change of action. So, to work around this problem, we'll just do the same thing we did when the player gets hit. We'll add a stomp when the player gets interrupted in his dash. This will clear the area around himself, allowing him enough time to make sense of his surroundings and come back into the fight. With that done, our arrows are finally complete and ready to be officially added to the battlefield. Stay tuned for our fifth episode of our Road to Steam series, where we will cover the progress we'll make on the game in the coming weeks. If you have any feedback or just anything you want to share, don't be shy, and fill the comment section down below. If you enjoyed our content and want to support the channel, feel free to leave a like and subscribe. On this, Godspeed to all of you, and we'll see you on the next episode of our Road to Steam series.